so hello everyone welcome to a very I, I i feel like i need to come up with a different word than exciting episode because it's exciting to me i love this type of stuff i uh we're going to be talking about ritual remedy um to me this is very witchy kind of work like the creative the intuitive the connection to the natural world um so i'm super excited there's the word again to speak with our author today mara brownscomb am i saying that right you got it okay mm -hmm. cool who and mara thank you so much for being here i'll briefly introduce you and i will let you add to this uh, Mara is a yoga and meditation teacher. Uh, she's a writer, a mother, an artist, a ceremonialist, and a spirit coach. She finds great joy in leading others along the path of self-transformation. She is passionate about weaving the art of mindfulness, self-care, mind-body practices, and earth-based rituals into her offerings. Mara is joining us from Vancouver, Canada, which I think is cool because I'm in Vancouver, Washington, so we're in the two Vancouvers. I'm holding her beautiful book. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, <laughs> Ritual as Remedy, Embodied Practices for Soul Care. So Mara, how are you today? Thank you for being with us. I'm great, Tessa. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, for sure. So this book has been in the world and uh, since June of 2022, I was going to say 2021, I'm not sure what planet I'm living on. Mm -hmm. um, and just so you know, this episode will be airing in the fall of 2022, which to me feels like a very ritualistic time in terms of when I usually start to return to like a different sort of pace in my life and I think a lot about morning routine and evening routine and ways to book in my day and make it very um I don't know there's something about the fall to me that feels very ritualistic mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on this absolutely and we have fall equinox coming this year it's coming on September 22nd and so I feel that there is a, a cosmic universal energy for those of us living in this hemisphere anyway where you know it's also when we used to return to school right mm -hmm. yeah and when the the harvest season we see the leaves changing colors we can feel it right now i was out on a morning walk i could start to feel the shift even though it's still really hot it's palpable mm -hmm. and so this is in our dna our ancestors you know the part of their rituals daily was to harvest the food to survive the winter and so no wonder you feel that and why we are inclined to become more rhythmic and ritualistic in the fall. Mm, yeah, that's, yeah. And I think that in our modern times, there's kind of this, at least I've sort of experienced it for myself in my adult life. There's almost this, like, I will dismiss that as being more childlike or as being um, too woo woo or too, I don't know, I want to say hippie. And, um, even though I don't believe that because I very much grew up with this, with, with parents and a family that surrounded me that were very ritualistic and did practice all kinds of ritual throughout the different seasons and who, who were very connected with nature. So it's interesting to me to have this kind of self-talk that I notice that has this connotation towards that orientation to life. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's just something, a phase that we go through in adulthood. Maybe it's just me. I'm curious what you experience in your work around this. Mm -hmm. That's just very interesting that you bring this forward. It, it almost sounds like, you know, this impulse in you wants to, you know, continue to, to work in this rhythmic way. And yet there's, the, the discernment of, no, I'm not a child anymore. I'm an adult now. And, and what does this mean to me now? Mm -hmm. And I think this is the beauty of the work is these one question that I always ask myself and I guide others in this question is um, what is true in this moment now for me? What is true? And so if what is true is this desire to become more rhythmic and become more routine-like and to connect more deeply with the you know, the subtleties of nature, then that's, that's where we go. And I always love to say to lean into what lights you up. 
and to in a way make it sacred or holy and if those words don't work for you make it special make it extraordinary so as simple as waking up with the morning coffee or tea as we enter into this fall season could be at least five minutes with not turning your phone on to light a candle to honor the shift in the seasons coming and when we show up for ourselves in this way i feel like it's it's like the nectar of goodness and compassion and like deep soul love that we're actually giving back to ourselves yeah i love that so much i think in me the voice I know this isn't my own voice that's having that judgment, that's having that kind of self-talk about, oh, you need to let go of this idea of being a child and, and that is, you know, alternative lifestyle, which it's it's so much ingrained in who I am, but for some reason in my adult life, I've pushed away, like I just said, but there's this call, like you're saying, to return to that and to honor it. And this became apparent to me the other day, I was watching, there's this Netflix I don't think it's really a documentary. It's kind of like this exploration of cats. I don't know if you've heard of it, but yeah. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's kind of like um, an insight into what cats are thinking. And, and that got me on this track of how cats, you know, seem to be very popular with certain people. And it's kind of like you either love cats or you don't love cats. And in this Netflix documentary, they started to talk about how the black cat became demonized during um, mm. prior to the black plague um, mm. during like the witch hunts and stuff. And, and then they went on to um, define a witch as a woman who was a healer. She was a wise woman. She knew a lot about nature. Um, she knew a lot about how to heal and health. And one of the things, or two of the things that this wise woman would do daily was, well, they would have a cat because cats kept away the rodents and therefore it kept down the spread of disease. And also they would have a broom so they would sweep out the daily debris from the house. So they kept their space very clean. And then the rise of the, I believe it was the Catholic church that began to demonize um, women and in particular black cats as being um you know satanic so then there was this like uh what is the word i want to use push to eradicate cats and then so this documentary is saying pontificating that perhaps that contributed to the black plague because as the the cats were eradicated then the vermin proliferated and disease spread more easily. And so <laughs> I'm going down this tangent, <laughs> not only because I have two black cats and I've had cats my whole life, but this body of work, Ritual as Remedy, got me thinking about the reclamation of, as women, this connection with our innate ability to heal and our innate wisdom and the connection with nature and the cyclical um, way of being in the world and using our natural environment to heal. And, and, the, and this is all very prevalent and threaded throughout your book. I mean, it is the essence of the book, in my opinion, in my experience, having gone through it. So having said all of that, I would love if you would just start us off by you know if we're new to this kind of work if they're new to this kind of idea for returning to it like i am what is ritual what is a ritual mm -hmm. well thank you for that story first of all that sparks all sorts of insights and and depth around us as healers and women as holders of ancient wisdom and that we are so attuned to the moon through our cycles through our menses cycle through um, childbearing years, whether we choose to do that or not. So that, you know, that's a big body of work to unpack. So thank you. So a ritual to me is anything that's done with intention. It is making our habits holy and sacred. It is welcoming the, um, the extraordinary, the moments of being in full presence, not thinking about the past or the future, in full presence. And that right there 
is what ritual is to me. Mm, I love that. I also think about, um, I'm curious how this relates to this body of work, the idea, not only in full presence, but being able to tap creativity and using creativity as a guide, an intuitive guide. How do you do you work with that in the, in this body of work? How would you recommend someone that, you know, struggles with feeling creative? I'll give you an example. So, um, I, I, I'm a very ritualistic person. I get up every day, like most of us, and I have this habit of having coffee. And lately while I'm having my coffee, I have been practicing writing and speaking, um, positive self-talk. I just interviewed a woman on the show. She, her book is uh, Coffee Self-Talk. Um, Kristen Helmstetter, shout out to you. Great. And I, she was talking about how to pair like a morning routine with uh, a ritual such as positive self-talk. So I'm sitting there having my coffee. I'm either writing or saying out loud some affirmations. And, and then I'm realizing I feel like I could get more creative with this. Like, for example... If I had no, you know, uh, judgments or boundaries around what it was that I could do with my life and what I recognized as my life purpose, what would I then go and do with my life? And I felt like this kind of, like a void, like nothing really spoke back to me, mm -hmm. aside from the obvious things that I've always said, like writing, which feels like I'm stopping short of thinking outside of the box. So I'm curious, how do we use our creativity if we feel like it's hard to access, mm -hmm. to think a little bit bigger, to be a little bit more open? Mm -hmm. yeah, great question. So, and I think, uh, you know, working with mind, body, somatic modalities here is, so you could, for example, you're doing your positive self-talk in the morning great practice speaking out loud beautiful powerful practice and you could go one step further and um, get on your mat or get on in, if you have a creative movement practice or you know if you want to go deeper into um not just in the mind but like really embodying it so what does that look like it will look like something different for everyone um but to move with that vibration, to move with that positive frequency of self-talk, then where does that take you? It may take you beyond the image of you writing. It may take you into um, an intuitive flash of what you're going to be writing, who's your audience, when you're going to get that out there in the world. So that's what I feel that this steadiness of ritual ritual and rhythm are paired together in my experience and my belief and we can rely on them to go hand in hand almost like the sun and the moon the masculine the feminine so we're riding these waves even through the hard complex times in life we get an opportunity perhaps to understand what is anxiety and what is intuition? And that's where I feel the work brings us into present moment awareness and wholeness. How would you discern between anxiety and intuition? Do you feel like they sometimes can feel s similar in the body from a somatic perspective? Great question. I think it really depends where you're at in your life. Also for women with our menstrual cycle and our home our hormones it's huge it's massive it's like we cannot under um, estimate what we go through on a monthly basis and to really get in tune with that and so it does vary in for me personally what stage of my cycle i'm in however this is what i love to ask myself and what i share with others also is that anxiety always has a backstory anxiety has this like um thing from the past or like remember when I did that and and that and I failed at that or I wasn't good enough at that or and it almost brings this this and it can bring adrenaline so it's it is really hard to discern right yeah. what is yeah and then intuition feels softer for me it feels like it just goes whew, 
here's a message for you right now, like almost like a flash or sometimes a photographic snapshot, or it just feels like a big yes, like a big, bold yes. However, we have been conditioned to not trust that big, bold yes because of the society and culture that we live in, because of patriarchy, because of you know many, many, many things. And so the work for us, male or female in this modern age is to know ourselves well enough to understand to do the to do the work to do the counseling to do the therapy to get receive the support to understand what is your anxiety and where does it come from and it was there trauma involved and 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 to begin to become generative as opposed to predictive predictive is when Predictive energy is to me kind of that anxious energy or that stressed energy. Like you're predicting that you're going to not be able to do it. Mm. And then, yeah, that generative, like, what am I? So even as you had your, your, your positive self-talk, it's such a great example. You're drinking your coffee. It's a beautiful beginning of a day. And then go like, what am I generating? Mm. What am I generating here? And like, where does, where do I feel that in my body? Can I welcome that into my lower abdominal area right now? Can I bring it into my heart? Yeah, thank you. Generative versus predictive. I love this because it, um, that does help me bring it down into a felt sense and kind of localize. Okay. And I guess categorize because I'm always kind of, you're right. For me, the, the intuitive voice is much softer. It's more quiet and I've spent many years ignoring it. So it's harder to hear. <laughs> right. So this is, this is great. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we're, again, if we're new to the path of ritual and, you know, I already mentioned one morning routine, but are there some other simple rituals that you would suggest people try to start off? Mm-hmm. So that morning ritual, bookending our days, um, the evening ritual is something that I like to bring forward. And it is, what do you do in the 30 to 60 minutes before you go to bed? And really to start to look at that. Um, you know, we're, a lot of us are viewers. We like to view our, our things and our consumer media or scroll, scroll on social media. When I do that, it doesn't make me feel good um, before I go to bed. It brings out an anxious energy, in fact. So I need to not have, you know, media 30 to 60 minutes at least. And I like to think about um, sometimes I take a a warm shower or maybe I can go for an ocean dip (laughs) or a lake swim or some some kind of water bath to wash off the day Mm. and to work with some plant energies like lavender, um, lavender oil on the soles of the feet, drinking chamomile tea and really acknowledging that your work for the day is done and we are very sensitive beings and so if we do not acknowledge that our work for the day is done we're going to continue to bring it into our sleep and that can create as we know restlessness and uh, more stress or fear or doubt or anxiety so Another ritual I love to do is to think about once a day, honoring the food that I eat. Mm. So a simple way um, is to just, you know, as you're eating, wherever it came from, you know, just internally or externally, um, that gratitude to the farmers. If you eat animal products, gratitude to the animals. Um, And then I just place my hands gently over, over the food just to connect like center of the body healing of the hands, energy of the whole body into the food, nourishment, soul nourishment. And that can take like one to two minutes. Um, Yeah, Yeah. that's a great way to slow down too. If you're someone who um, eats quickly or kind of unconsciously, that simple practice of pausing and giving thanks, having gratitude, thinking about nourishment is a really great, great way to slow down the whole entire process of consuming your food, which is better for your digestion anyways. Absolutely. Um, 
So I'm, I'd love to know a little bit more about your background in terms of, you know, how you got to where you are today. What called you along this path? What it, what inspired you to write this book? That's many questions. I'll let you start yeah. where you'd like yeah. to. This book, uh, Ritual as Remedy, was birthed out of an online course that I taught for five years prior to COVID. And to go further, so it was a, a four-week online offering um, based on the pagan or Celtic wheel of the year. So my ancestors are um, Scottish, English, Irish, and I stumbled upon a great, beautiful treasure as I was 16 years old, and I went to my first fire ceremony with my best friend's mom who was part of um, a pagan circle. And it was very, very open. It was very, I, I felt like I landed home. I had no idea that there was actually a system or um, a way to honor the full moon like this. And I had always been, my first memory was the moon. I, I'm just, I'm a moon child. I love the moon. I'm a moon gazer. I follow her, um, you know, new moon, full moon, every new moon, full moon. So that's how I got into the work. And then I became mentored. So that was like very formative, right? It was pre-college. I, I came from a very conservative middle-class background. Like no, none of that existed in my life before. Um, and it just lit me up so much. And I learned about the elements and the power of earth, air, fire, water, ether, and how to weave in the equinoxes and the solstices. So it became very sacred to me. I then went on to, you know, I went to India to study yoga at a young age. And um, my life has been dedicated, I would say, to um, the spiritual arts. Um, and I'm a dancer, a choreographer, and took that also as a very spiritual um, journey. And so that's how I got to where I am. I've studied the pagan um, wheel of the year and I've studied the Peruvian shamanic wheel of the year, which is very informative. Um, and, you know, even in the early days in, in university, we call it in Canada, university college, um, I was studying world religion. I was studying Eastern philosophy, mysticism. All of these were like treasures that I was discovering along the way and they also felt very familiar to me and then so I then went on to teach for years and years and years and and then the book and talking about intuition the book came like a flash it just it just came like whew. I saw myself holding the book like I, I had a photographic snapshot of me holding the book and the message was do it for the collective hmm. And so I thought, oh, it was like so strong. You know, I don't have those very often in my life. You know, I think we can all have one or two times where we go, that was a really strong, powerful feeling in my body. Mm -hmm. And then I, ha I felt like it was more uncomfortable to not write the book than to actually do the work and write the book. Like I was restless until I decided and committed, yes, I'm doing that. Yeah. Mm. I feel like that's what I'm waiting for that rest. <laughs> I've heard so many people say that in terms of that thing that calls to them, but there's something in the way, right? You're being blocked by, you know, motivation, willpower, um, many other things you might feel like is in the way. And then people say what, this is what I've heard. People say what you said, the, th the not doing it became more uncomfortable than just kind of letting it sit out there undone. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I resonate with that. And I, also, when I hear you say that, I'm like, ah, oh, what must what must that feel like? Mm -hmm. And perhaps I'm not ready yet. Um, well, and can I just add to that? Yeah, um, please. Because I want to empower you that um, you know we continue to to dig into where you know your true interests are and your true love your true desire is and that will always lead us no time is it that's the thing for me like I've done many many different things and followed different paths and had many several careers and I feel that it's all informed the next thing it's yeah. all part of it so it's like stepping stones along the river mm -hmm. and yes, at certain points in their life. And based on our astrology, there's many, many factors at play here um, that you may just go. And your steadiness will get you there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate the encouragement. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious to hear more about what that first ceremony was like if you 
are able to share, what did it consist of? Kind of like, how did you begin? What, what sort of practice were you initiated into? Mm -hmm. What did that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So this uh, particular group is called Sisters of the Shields, and it was essentially a women's group. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, I then was mentored by um, one woman. In, so, so each person got an elder that they were then mentored for by. And that first ceremony, however, was was very um, inviting. It was a fire circle. The elements were called forward. Um, it was like a prayer for sacred space, similar almost as, as you know, in the yoga studio or the meditation room as we honor um, the space that we're in. So very reverent um, and joyous energy. And um, we each had some offerings to give to the fire that were symbolic of, you know, um, old beliefs, negative core beliefs or old patterns or even, you know, things from our ancestry that we are, you know, ready to not carry. And so it was put forward very simply, very clearly. It was held in a way that was not overdone. Um, it was just very true and very authentic. Um, and then, you know, we went into song together uh, for some time. So it was, I think it was the, the best first experience that I could have ever had. Mm. And are Sisters of the Shield still active today? Um, they're not still active today that I know of. And um, yeah, I still have these sheets, you know, from my younger, I mean, this is a long, long, long time ago. So uh it's just, it's so kindred. And I always give a shout out to them because I, my life would have taken a different direction had I not been there that night. So, um, what, if someone were wanting to join a group like this today, do you have any recommendations about where they would find something like that? That mm -hmm. was, you know, maybe provided some mentorship and, met regularly, rhythmically. I feel like there's so many resources. I have so many books and texts about how to create, including yours, which is a beautiful body of work. But I think what so many of us are craving are that actually coming together in community, in person, mm -hmm. um, and performing these rituals together as a community. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations about how to find that? Mm -hmm. Well, particularly if you're looking for in person, you should just, I would just look, is anyone holding a fall equinox gathering? That's a great place to begin. I feel like that's um, a very true, uh, the, the solstices and the equinoxes, a lot of yoga teachers are now holding um, new moon, full moon circles. Um, you can begin yourself doing that simply by honoring, gathering with some um, like-minded folk, inviting them over. Um, and having a new moon ceremony where you drink tea and, you know, maybe there's a creative act and you journal and there's a, a sharing. So, so I think that, and that's what I wanted to unpack in the book. So first of all, yeah, you can find your people and your teachers and sometimes it's harder to find than others. There's a lot of online stuff. Um, I certainly offer usually every new moon, full moon. I call them spirit sessions where I do breath work, meditation, some kind of movement, and then we do a ritual online together. Um, but that's what I wanted. The message of the book for the collective was to uh, give people permission to self guide. I've been kind of mentoring and coaching women for the past 15 years on, you know, how to live their best life and how to, you know, make these transitions, maybe career transition to, to become more fulfilled. And what I've learned through these programs that I've taught is that people know how to, once they have a couple of tools and resources, they can then self-guide. Mm -hmm. They can then create their own rituals that feel good to them. And so that was that really strong message. Of, and that's the feedback I've received is like, oh, I know how to do it now. And I, bef I've empowered myself because I'm creating what's true for me. It feels good for me every full moon to light a candle and to, you know, sit with my journal and go out through all the things that, you know, I'm holding on to that I've accumulated energy, words, thoughts, feelings, vibrations, and, and I'm going to let it out because I know that I'm going to be more clear and vast and capable in my own body and generative if I do that. Mm. So 
um, where was I going to go with this? I had a question about, um, oh, I know what it was. There's a couple of different threads I want to follow in terms of creating our own circles with a beautiful text like yours as a guide in terms of, um, do we do it? What are the differences between having a ceremony like this on a full moon versus a new moon? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, go ahead with that one, please. So this, and this is what I would recommend anyone inclined, like even a tiny bit <laughs> through this conversation, go to the farmer's almanac and see the dates, plug in new moon and full moon all the way until winter solstice mm -hmm. so that, okay, so you could commit right now today to observing. It doesn't mean you have to do something massive every time, but you're observing and you are part of an energy that is bigger than you or us. That's why we do this work. We get out of our own ego. We get connected with the cosmos. I mean, it's amazing. So new moon is new beginning. It's like planting seeds in your garden, regardless of the season. So you want to just hold space on the new moon uh, of what am I ready and willing to begin mm -hmm. at this time, at this cycle? So because the moon cycle is every 29 and a half days, right? So the new moon is the beginning of that. Then we go 12 to 14 days later is the full moon. So the new moon, we go quiet, we go in the full moon as it's, you know, starting to wax, it's getting bigger. Then all of a sudden there she is glowing, gorgeous orb in the sky. And the full moon is that pretty expansive, wild energy. And of course, the moon, the, you know, the wolves howl at full moon. And of course, our animals and our cats and our dogs, they all feel it. Our children feel it. Mm -hmm. Our colleagues feel it. Our relationships often get a little bit, you know, could get a little dramatic. So the full moon, not only is it this big, beautiful, abundant energy where you go, ha, you know, I release what no longer serves and I invite in what does serve. But the full moon is so special because she reflects back to us what is out of balance in our own life. Ah. <laughs> so it's a different spin, right? It's a different spin on it. It's not like, oh, the full moon's making me crazy. And oh, I didn't sleep because of the full moon. Well, actually the full moon, she comes in as a teacher, as a luminary, powerful luminary in the sky. And she says, hey, maybe you're not sleeping because of this or this. Or maybe it's time to have a reset on your relationship and have a, you know, a moment of truth with each other and really get into the healing because that's what's needed at this time. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I'm curious, since you started this in your teens, what does your rhythmic ritual look like? How do you personally practice ceremony with the moon? So exactly, as I just said, I, I always make sure it's in my phone. I, I don't want to miss it. I want to, I want to know it's in my calendar. And so the new moon, if I'm, if I'm not leading group, cause I often lead group on new moon and full moon. And I love this work. It's just like the best work if I'm doing. And I also do, you know, my own to preserve my own energy body often new moon in the, you know, the fall, winter, spring, I will have a new moon bath. I will do a full Epsom soap lo load with essential oils and rose petals and candles. And um, after that, I'll go into, you know, probably a restorative deep release with the hips and the shoulders kind of on my yoga mat. Um, and then I work with prayer. You know, I work with honoring what I'm putting out into the universe. That, that's those intention seeds. Mm -hmm. I often get a hit creatively at new moon of like, okay, that's, that's where I want to go right now, which will then help and support a lot of the writing practices that I do and the teaching that I put out into the world. And then same at full moon, it's, it's, you know, and I have children. So I, I work with my children in this way. I have two girls, they're eight and 11 now, but they were often, you know, building an altar outside. So I work a lot with altars. I mean, anyone wanting to start this work, making an altar at new moon or full moon. And by that, I mean, represent the elements, um, earth, air, fire, water. Um, you could have a bouquet of seasonal flowers. You could have some special stones or crystals um, that you love, um, an oracle 
deck sitting right there, ready to flip it, or, um, you know, an, an affirmation for this cycle and this time of your life. And I often get my children to make the altar or we call the centerpiece, even in the, I have several, <laughs> they're all over our house. Um, because you know why? It brings us into a state of beauty. Mm -hmm. It reminds us of beauty. It reminds us of the earth and the water, the air, the fire. And there's something so anchoring about that. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. I love that. I'm curious when you're setting an intention or whatever comes to you, a spark during new moon time, does that follow does that seed follow you through that whole new moon cycle or does it start to shift as the full moon comes into fruition great question and for clarity you can write it in your journal so you can reflect back on your intentions right because as you evolve every day i feel that we're humans on this planet to evolve mm -hmm. that is definitely something i believe is true and so as you go through that, you know, that two weeks almost until full moon, you may have a shift in perspective, which is really important to your process. So when you look and let's say, okay, new moon, let's say yeah, an example would be, um, we'll take writing for an example. Um, I'm going to write a short poem every day. Could be three lines, could be a haiku. I'm going to sit and write a short poem every day until the full moon. And so if you commit to that, something that you can commit to, perhaps, you can see your evolution, your process. You can see how the words might shift and change. You can see how your energy resists, maybe, or persists, or um, you can see what is predictive or generative as we were talking about. It's really fascinating. It's, it's helpful for the process. I think that's what you were talking about earlier. How do I take my process further? Mm. I'm, I'm a Virgo too. So I'm, I'm kind of about that. I'm, I'm like, I like to give myself little tasks and, you know, I like, I always say, and this is all in the book is follow the desire, release the outcome. Mm. Mm. So I've actually written another book that's going to come out July, 2023. Surprise, surprise. And do you know how that book came to start? Because I said, I'm going to write a poem a day for a month. Oh, are you, and, um, can you expound upon this? Is it a book of poetry? Are you able to talk about okay, it? Okay. So yes, I will talk <laughs> about this. I'll share the secret. Um, and I'm just in final edits right now and same publisher it's on the female archetypes I'm so excited for this book to come out it's kind of like a sequel but different so this is like soul care the ritual is the practices mm -hmm. and then the the female archetype book is about how to like really empower all aspects of yourself so I wrote a poem a day for 30 days I took it to my writing coach and she's because I thought I'll, I'll put out a book of poetry uh -huh. like I because I do prayer poems right so I'm doing kind of spiritual nature-based poems and not rhyming poems. And so she looks and she's like, mm, I'm not so sure it kind of goes together. And like, I was pulling all these pieces in. So I literally sat down on the floor and I, I got them all printed. I printed all these poems and I cut them all up. I, cut, I had hundreds of poems uh, around me because it was more than 30 because I then had poems from the past. So I started to place them into categories. And then I was like, oh, this is like archetypal work. This is like the mother. This is like the huntress. This poem is resonant of the sage, the wise woman. And so, and then that's how that concept got birthed. So there's an example of a creative process that's that so I feel cool. the ritual brought me into that. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I love this. This is so cool. Do you, do you see, um, I, I just want to hear a little bit more about like, how the book, how we can work with the book. And maybe this is like podcast round two. I don't know if you'd be interested in that um, when it comes out. Cause I'm envisioning like a deck of archetypes um, that you might work with like tarot. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. Is there anything else you can divulge? <laughs> yes. And, us, uh, and cause it's the format is very similar to the ritual book. So in the ritual book, I'm using the elements 
Mm -hmm. I'm using the five elements and then there's a chapter on the moon and then there's a chapter on the energy of the mystic, the modern mystic, which is, I feel all of us on this path of being good people in the world mm -hmm. is, is what to me, a modern mystic is to be a good ancestor. And so the archetype um, work, the divine, you know, feminine, it's similar in that I choose seven archetypes to work with, like the elements almost. And then at the end of each archetype, so I, I talk about the light aspect, I talk about the shadow. So it's a lot of shadow, good shadow work. It's like, mm -hmm. okay. And so there's a lot of opportunity for healing in there and self-reflection. And then the second part of each chapter, similar to the ritual book, is embodied practices to welcome in that archetype. Because I feel that we're all of the archetypes. Like we have an opportunity throughout our life to be all the archetypes, depending on what cycle of life we're in, not related to age at all. Mm, definitely. Okay. Thank you for sharing. I'm definitely yeah. going to keep that on my radar. I cannot wait. I love archetype and um, mm -hmm. yeah, just guide kind of work. So this is, I'm excited for that. I, I want to take a little bit of a turn and talk a little bit more about your experience teaching yoga and meditation. I'm so curious about this um, with your background, having studied in India and also then bringing it back to the West in our modern day culture, applying these practices to Western life, to modern life. I also teach yoga and I find myself kind of, um, I'm doing this thing with my body where I'm like leaning forward and then I'm pulling back. And that's mm -hmm. what it feels like to me. It's like very much a push pull of like, yes, this is medicine. Yes, this is healing. And then there's the pull back of like, well, is it cultural appropriation? How do I honor these ancient practices? How do I share it with people that need it? Because when you were describing um, finding your women's circle at such a young age, that's how I felt when I found my yoga practice. I felt like a return to home. It felt familiar. It felt like, oh yes, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And then it just felt natural to start sharing it with people. Well, years before I ever thought of teaching, I just was like, come to class with me, come practice with me. Um, so could you talk a little bit about your experience, your approach to teaching and your thoughts around modern day integration of these ancient practices? Right. Yes. And I'm similar to you in that push pull. Um, and that, and it's good, right? Because I think we, we all need to be, you know, really aware and attuned to where does this come from? And how do I honor this? And what does this mean for me? My teaching has really evolved over the years. Like it, it's, this is what I feel is that if the practice is deeply embodied in you, mm -hmm. um, and then that inspiration is strong for you to then go guide others. That to me is an authentic, true connection. And that you're serving the room in which you are, you're, in, you're being in service. We're being in service to support others on their healing and guiding path and journey. And, you know, I've pulled back on, you know, I don't say namaste, for example, at the end of practices anymore. So I, I think it's really individual and I think it's really um, understanding. Um, I mean, like we can look at mysticism and we can look at all the religions and all the cultures all over the world. Like it's, it's, it's evolved, it's evolving. And it's like, how is that integrated in you personally? Is it clear? Is it a clear yes? That's that big, bold yes that doesn't come from, with a backstory, then it's authentic and it's true. And then it can be shared in that way. And you can um, hold space to be in service of the practice. That's, how, that's what I feel. And I, I feel that because we see a lot of, you know, I know we see a lot of yoga that's quite commercial and that's you know, not honoring lineages and it's um, about wearing like tiny little outfits and, you know, that whole thing. Um, that exists, that will probably always exist. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're a person that wants more depth and understanding, then keep studying, keep learning, keep honing your skills. Um, that keeps you in it. 
I feel that keeps you in the work as opposed to the feeling that you shouldn't be doing it or a guilty something energy. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. What was it like studying in India? What was that experience like? Absolutely amazing. Uh, Yeah, it was incredible. And I, and it was, it was, I was very young and we would sit on the rooftop in Varanasi and first we would drink our chai and silence. I mean, it was just also, I love India so much. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I then went and it became a solo practice for me. So after studying in India, first of all, I found Iyengar's Light on Yoga book when I was 17, mm. first year university, because I was a gymnast, you see, growing up. So I, when I retired from gymnastics at 16, um, and then I was studying Eastern philosophy. So part of a project I was doing an essay anyway, Light on Yoga, right in the library, boom, never had done yoga in my life, started studying on my own. Two years later, I was in India. Um, studying. And so these were all, I felt like I was just doing it by myself. Like there was no yoga studios then where I was, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. I was just Mm self-studying. And I went also to Thailand and I did a a 12 day sit um, in Theravada Buddhism, actually. Um, So I had a lot of these inner, quite deep, profound experiences that then um, sparked my curiosity to go deeper in the work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was all just so colorful and deep and profound and very challenging to travel at a young age in other countries by myself. Um, yeah. Mm. Amazing. That sounds really cool. Thank you for sharing. Mm-hmm. So I want to be mindful of your time and there's m- many questions I'd still like to ask you, but I think I'll um, end with you know, maybe a two part question, which is, what do you hope people take away from this conversation and or the book? Um, And then I guess the second part of that would be, is there anything else, which you could probably answer this in in many different ways? Um, Is there anything else that you were hoping to uh, discuss today that we didn't get to? Mm or anything else you want people to walk away with? Well, I hope people walk away with um, from our conversation, perhaps a, a curiosity uh, around becoming attuned with their environment and the rhythms of nature. And that once we are even aware, so it just begins with this first, this first energy of awareness something happens where again we get more spacious maybe less egoic less self-centered and what i like to call this centric we become more centric we become more embodied in our center by being connected to our external environment it's more powerful than we know and to let that be mysterious and magical and miraculous filled with wonder and joy keeps us steady in this very complex world we live in. What else I would love to share is that we all are born intuitive. We are all born with the capacity to heal and to eventually self guide and to stay steady in it and let our adult life be a remembering of that. Mm. and let it be a a process that we ride the waves of life and when we sprinkle all of those waves with beauty and joy and goodness and compassion and devotion devotion to soul care devotion to understanding that we came from the stars which then became the microbes of the earth, which then became us. So this kind of cosmological view perhaps can keep us more steady. Mm, That's so beautiful. Mari, you have such a soothing voice. I I could sit here and listen to you talk. 
all day. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice to just, uh, I mean, not only do your words resonate and the message and the content behind it, but so too does the, the voice, the resonation of your voice. Thank you. Soothe. So I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. I, really I can't wait to share it. this. Well, everyone, that concludes another amazing episode of Outside the Studio. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned something new, maybe remembered something old, maybe felt inspired to apply something to your life. My... <laughs> You can hear my dog in the background. She's doing a little happy dance. Um, so Daisy enjoyed it. Anyhow, I wanted to just pop in here to wrap us up to say a couple of things. Number one, I have such an amazing team that helps me put these podcasts together. Without them, I wouldn't you know, be able to bring these amazing conversations to you. So thank you to my producer, my director of creative services, my sound editor, my um, engineer, Consistency Media. Don't know what I would do without you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the amazing creation and artistic, musical genius, Drew Lovern. Thank you so much for putting together this music for specifically for Outside the Studio. So unique to the show, only place you're ever going to hear it is right here. Thanks, you guys. You make my world go round. Stay well, everyone. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Share on the socials, especially if it's a show that you think, hey, this could help somebody else. That's what this is all about, right? We're sharing information so that we're better, um, so that we're inspired, so that we're lifting each other up. And we're learning how to be in this world, living on this planet to the best of our ability, sharing information and inspiring one another. And that's my hope. That's my hope for the show. Take care. <laughs>